I'm chapter 12. Jessie braced herself between the bread rack and the door. Every few seconds, she would think the vehicle couldn't possibly go any faster. Then it would make a gr gravelly noise, like some dying animal gasping for air, and speed up. With every burst of speed, Jessie's stomach churned, and the bread racks shook harder. Jessie remembered that Mr. Whittingham said every time Clifton heard of some new invention, ain't natural. Well, going this fast wasn't natural, and Jessie wasn't sure she liked it. In the front, the bread man was singing as carelessly as someone might sing strolling through Clifton. It even sounded to Jessie as if he had others singing with him, but the musical instrument or two. She had to be imagining that, though. Jessie shifted her grip to the unlatched side of the door. Caught some suddenly by a powerful wind, it sprung open. What the, the bread man in the front swove, s swore. He hit the brakes and then wa worked better. They worked better than the brakes on any carriage Jessie had ever been in. Jessie's body slammed against the latch, half of the truck's back end. The metal rack toppled against her. Some of the brightly packaged loaves of bread flew out the open door. Strangely, the music continued. Jessie crouched, watching, waiting for the bread man to turn around and see her. How could he, she explain? Would, she, would he force her to go back to Clifton? Would he call Miles Clifton and his men? She had to try to outrun him. But how could she run all at all after being hit by, a, by the bread racks? Jessie flexed her arms and legs, just a little, and decided nothing was broken. She'd probably end up with lots of bruises, but that was the least of her worries. The bread truck shuddered to a stop. The last loaf toppled on Jessie's head. Peering through the crooked racks, Jessie saw the bread man step out of his door. Jessie had a moment of panic. He was going to find her. Then he, she grabbed her pack and jumped out of the back door. Immediately, she spun around the side of the truck opposite the bread man. Maybe he wouldn't see her. An open ditch sloped before Jessie, and she rolled in it to tall grasses. Jessie peeked through the grasses in time to see the bread man come around the other side of the truck. He picked up a squished package of bread and threw it down in disgust. How am I going to explain this, he complained. I'm going to be even later and I won't have enough bread. They'll say I didn't latch the door and I know I did. He looked at the open door and Jessie ducked lower in the grass, afraid he'd start looking for someone else to blame. It's got to be broken, the bread man said. He fiddled with the latch and Jessie heard it clicking. Normal, the bread man said and swore. Jessie began to tremble. She felt sorry for the bread man, but she didn't pop up to explain the mysterious open door. He was probably, he was already mad and he probably wouldn't even listen to her. He'd just take her back to Clifton. He might do that anyhow if he found her. For all he knew, he, she, he might be one of Clifton's men. Jessie pressed closer to the ground as if he could make her invisible. He heard, she heard the bread man slam the door of the truck. He swore some more. Was he coming to look for her? Then he heard another vehicle pull up behind the bread truck. Peeking through the grasses, Jessie saw a red car. Can I help? What happened? The man's voice said. Door broke, the bread man said. Jessie heard the car door slam. The second man seemed to be looking around. What if he was looking for her? She risked another glance. She should know that she'd have to run, but both men were staring at the back of the truck. One help picking up the bread, the second man said. Nah, forget it, the bread man said in disgust. It's no good now. Then both men got in their vehicles and drove away. Jessie waited in the ditch for a while in case one of them figured out what happened and came back to look for her. But if they did, shouldn't she be far away as possible? Staying as low in the ditch as she could, she crept forward. Jessie wasn't sure how long her half crawl, half slither through the ditch. The knees of her pants were got wet and muddy. Her muscles began to ache of a usual position, she unusual position, and she decided she was being silly. Anyone looking for her would have reached the spot already. Those cars went fast and she wasn't going to beat them by crying. Besides, she needed to know if she was crying in the right direction. Jessie stood up. In front of her, two wide roads spread from horizon to horizon to horizon. It was the widest clearing Jessie had ever seen in her life the widest one she remembered at least. Even beyond the roads, there were no woods, even if only a few trees scattered in the pastures and besides houses. Jessie felt her throat catch at the unfamiliar sight. What had happened to all the trees? Sure, settlers were clearing space for farms and villages, but Mr. Smith had said a squirrel could cross Indian, Indiana jumping from tree to tree without once touching the ground, if he wanted to. 
Were the woods around Clifton the only ones left now? A car whizzed by and Jessie remembered she shouldn't have time to mourn the woods. She needed to find out if she was on the right road, going the right way. An enormous truck thundered by with a force that flattened the grasses by the road and whipped Jessie's hair around her face. Even if walking was slower, Jessie was glad to be out of the red truck. After a few moments of watching, Jessie noticed the cars traveled in different directions on different roads. On the road by Jessie, the cars went. Jessie glanced at the sun. It was too high overhead to be sure of a direction. How could she find out? Then she saw a sign several feet ahead. She ran toward it. The sign came into focus, 37. That was one of the numbers Ma had said might be the right road. Above it, the sign said north. Jessie grinned. She was going toward Indianapolis. Jessie touched the sign for good luck, amazed once again by the smoothness of the outside world's metal. She lost time escaping from Clifton and then the bread truck, and she was going in the right direction. She was bound to find one of those phone things soon. No one seemed to be looking for her. Surely the most frightening part of her journey was over. Jessie slung her pack over her shoulder and began walking north. She started out of the ditch and the ground was uneven, but the grasses tore her legs. Carelessly, forgetting the caution she pretended to borrow from Hannah, Jessie moved to the slope, to the place where the walking was easier, and she was in plain sight of every car that passed.